I'm Ron Toll, and I spoke the other day about symbiosis on land. Today I'm going to speak about symbiosis in the ocean. And to me, this is one of the most fabulous subjects there is to cover. Not only living together, but how all the behavior fits in so they all interact together. Uh, and being in the ocean, if you've ever been scuba diving or anything like that, you see all these other activities going on. Uh, all the different behaviors, I said, and it's, to me, one of the relaxingest things that you can do, even though you're, you know, all hyped up and swimming around and all that activity, but all the color and all the formations and everything that's out there uh, is doing their own thing and it just takes you away from this dog, eat, dog world that we live in. And if you ever get a chance to go scuba diving, take advantage of it. During the time of creation, man was given dominion uh, over all the natural world. Mankind has grant, taken for granted all this stuff that's around him. Uh, you know, as I showed you last Wednesday, the, most people just see a buffalo standing on the prairie, but all that's involved in all of that, uh, and it's the same under the ocean. And I want to try to get people to realize how delicate, how intertwined, and how miraculous this all is. Definition for symbiosis is coming together or living together. There's three different types. Parasitic, where one creature destroys the other creature. You got the parasite and the host. Then you have commensalism, where one creature benefits and the other is not harmed or benefits. And then you got mutualism, where they both benefit. And uh, you look at a place like the coral reef. It's got big predators. It's got small fish. It's got mammals. It's got everything on it. Uh, there's a reef in the Great Barrier Reef that they've been doing studies with. There's several, in fact. But one that they did, they tried to count and this was just one acre of land uh, underwater on the reef. And they tried to count all the different forms of life that was on there. And there was over 1,500 forms of life that they could count and see. And, and uh, that was just the fish. Then you have shrimp and crabs and sponges and corals and da-da-da-da-da. And each one of these, each fish may have as many as 50,000 parasites. So I'm talking about, look at, look at the diversity that's on just one acre. And if you go to the Philippines, it's even greater. <laughs> now, I've got some artifacts here to demonstrate my points. This is a tube worm. Uh, it grows in the substrate. And if you look at the bottom, it's different all over the world. But I did my studies on the Gulf Coast. And if you go to Mobile Bay and you go east, you got coral sand. If you go to the Mobile Bay and you go west, you got mud, and that's because of the currents and the tides and stuff. But these things burrow into the sand, and they start out small, and they grow, and they grow, and they grow. And this tube worm has got a big flowery mouth on it that collects the plankton, and that's what he eats. But as he's growing, uh, there's 
little shrimp that crawl down in this tube alongside of him, and little crabs and, and different types of other worms that live in this tube with him. You know, that's part of the uh, symbiosis of, of this thing. And now let's say he's grown to this size and the substrate is setting up here, but then the current comes along and washes some of the sand away and you've got this much exposed. Coral needs a hard surface to grow on. So the baby corals, the larval stages in the plankton, will fasten to this and then they'll start to grow. And that's the beginning of a reef. You've got a big hard surface on the bottom and then all these other different forms of coral grow from it. And this is what most corals look like. And I don't know if you can see the texture of this or not. If you want to come up and look later, it's fine. But it's a real rough substance. And here's a broken spot. You can see this out, out or shell or whatever you want to call it is the animal itself. And it's a colonial animal. Each one of these little rough surfaces here, or spots, is the animal itself. And it's nothing more than a, a little tiny tube with eight tentacles on the top. The tentacles catch the plankton. And then it, it's filled with zooxanthellae, uh, and that's a form of phytoplankton, or a plant plankton. This animal will catch the, the plankton and eat it, but it cannot digest it without that zooxanthellae. Uh, I used to have a saltwater aquarium that had a big anemone in it, and I had a cat, and so I would just cut my cat a piece of liver and cut the anemone a piece of liver, and the anemone would take it and eat it. But once all the... Uh, um, those anthelae uh, uh, died inside of the, the anemone. The anemone died. And that was because it wasn't getting enough light, you know. But anyway, these things work on the same principle. They have to have the light to stay alive. And there are hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of coral. Uh, this is black coral. It's only a small piece. Black coral gets as high as the ceiling. And if you get a good stem of black coral, the divers in the Mediterranean and stuff go down three, four hundred feet to cut off a stem of this. They bring it up and they sell it. They can sell it for thirty, forty thousand dollars. They use it in the jewelry industry, make jewels out of it. Um, this is fire coral. It's much more prevalent because it doesn't take nearly as much uh, zooxanthellae to keep it alive, but it's got, and I don't know if you can see this or not, uh, each one of the things has what they call nematocytes. And the anemones also have nematocytes. Uh, and this is what it looks like when it's inside of the animal. And when something brushes up against it, it shoots this little arrow out and catches the plankton. And then it wraps it up and pulls it back into the uh, animal itself. Uh, you know, how unique is that? And coral comes in many different sizes, shapes, and colors. Here's some purple coral. Here's blue coral. I've got some red coral at home, but my slab was like that, and I didn't want to tote it along with me. <laughs> and. Here's another 
piece of coral, and this is of a different variety. You can see all the ridges and stuff on this. And the animal itself grows between these ridges. When it's got ridges like this, and I've got six or seven different species of the stuff with ridges, it has more than one mouth. All of these have just <coughs> one mouth per animal. And this is, again, a group of different animals that have colonized. Uh, you look at the animal itself grows between these ridges, and it might have three or four mouths in one animal itself. Um, these aren't true corals, but they still have all the different palps and stuff on them that make it alive. These are called sea fans. This is what it looks like, and this is a plastic one. Because, but this looked identical to that, and once it dries out, all the calcium covering falls off of it. But you can see how net-like this looks, and it's a situation that it still allows all the plankton and stuff to go through, and all of these live on plankton. If it wasn't for the plankton, the reef wouldn't exist. So, uh, you know, and you take the reef itself. You got this kind, and then this kind moves in and fastens in, and and this one will set up here and take hold and I mean you got if you go out on a reef you might have 15 20 different varieties of, of coral or, or some places even more than that and now each one of these pieces of coral they use what they say the the um, coral reef but each one of these places of coral harbors little fish, little crabs, little shrimp, uh, all different kinds. Did that already? Here's a picture of what a reef looks like, or a coral community. Look at all the different animals on there. I don't know if you can see it in the back there, but there's hundreds and hundreds of different animals. Within the branches of the coral, the little fish swim, and you know, they swim above the piece of coral, and, and, and then here comes a shark comes swimming by, and they fall back down in between the blades of coral because they know the shark can't get there. And that's how they protect themselves from the predators and these different, there's different kinds of fish. There's fish that eat the corals and they take a bite off of a piece of coral and they grind it up in their mouth and they take the zooxanthellae out of it. That's what they use for nutrition. And then the coral sand comes out the other end and that's how these coral sand bottoms are formed uh, from the destruction of the reef. And yet, if you listen to the media, man is doing it. Coral reef also, they've discovered in the last couple of decades, the coral reefs are turning white and they're dying and they're blaming it on excess heat in the water but that's not what's causing it. The corals themselves have covered with a scum of mucus, and this mucus falls off of them and floats in the water there, and if the current doesn't carry them away, then it's a situation, it just sits there and molds and builds up toxins and so on and so forth, and, and that's what's killing the reefs. Uh, there used to be a starfish crown of thorns that went around and ate the coral like the fish do. And, you know, the, the fishermen could see that the reefs were being eaten 
and they found out that the crown of thorns was the one that was doing it. So they caught the crown of thorns and they'd take their knife and just whack it up into many different pieces and toss them back in, figuring the fish would eat them. But all these different pieces regenerated to a new crown of thorns and, you know, they added to their problems. Uh, now they go around with a syringe filled with formaldehyde and they just, and that formaldehyde kills them right off of the bat. Uh, I don't have any anemones with me. I got them at home, um, and they're in a little jar that's filled with formaldehyde. Because you, uh, anemone, if you just set it out and dry it, it just flakes out and disappears. But uh, that way you can keep them in a, a form like that you can actually see what it is. And, and there's a lot of animals that live in the, the anemones too. They call it an anemone community. And you can see this big blob there is representing the anemone and all the little fish and little crabs and stuff that live within it. Uh, there's Not only do fish and crabs live within it, there are three species that I know of, of crabs that carry anemones on their back. They provide the anemone with mobility to get around in different forms of water and different foods and eating the, the uh, plankton then, as well as then the crab benefits by having the anemones on his back. Well, that protects him, but he's also using them for camouflage. You know, the normal fish would just see well, anemone, I know, I'm not supposed to get close to them, so it just uh, avoids it. And there's two species of crabs that do that, and there's one species that's got special little uh, claws, I guess you could call them, and he will take and put an anemone in each one of his claws, and he holds them up, and you know, and when something comes to try to eat him, he sticks those anemones out in front of him, and you know the fish or the predator uh, leaves him alone. And all this behavior, to me, I find fascinating. Uh, there's also a little fish out there called a carapidae. <laughs> very unique, very different. He looks like a blade of a knife with a mouth on this end. Anybody want to take a guess where he lives? He lives in the anus of a sea cucumber. He'll get to find the back end of the sea cucumber and he'll, you know, play with him a little bit and pretty soon his tail will be inserted and then he backs all the way in. And that's his form of protection. And the sea cucumber doesn't benefit by it at all, but he's, the fish is protecting himself. And another thing about this one is he's very territorial. If, if it's a female, it's a situation that she will have her babies inside of the sea cucumber, and then when she goes out, she sucks a few of them out, and the current carries them away, and whatever don't gets sucked out, she will back in again and eat the rest of them. Mm. Only one fish per sea cucumber. You know, population control. Uh, now I'm going to talk about barnacles. These are barnacles. You can see this is the back side and this is the front side. The backside produces a form of glue and glues itself to whatever. Uh, each barnacle out there is species specific, meaning it will only fasten to something, to one special kind. This is the one that does 
fastens to boats and whales, uh, the big objects. But you, you look at the opening of this, and inside of this opening is like a shrimp that's glued on its back. When you see this in a live function, you'll see something come up out of this, these holes, and then all of a sudden, And that's him collecting food. He takes it down and eats it, goes and gets more. And the barnacles are an interesting creature too. Like I said, they're species specific. Uh, there's one that I find super uh, interesting. And I've seen them on the lungs of crabs where they can get their oxygenated water and stuff like that, and also plankton. I've seen them on uh, different, you've all seen videos of them being on whales and different creatures and on the post of docks and stuff on this order. But there's one little species down there in the Indo-Pacific Ocean. It lives on the scales of sea snakes, and it's about as big around as the period at the end of one of the sentences in your Bible. That's how big it is. Now you, you put one of them out there in the middle of this big, big, big ocean, how does he find a sea snake? He floats around till he does. And when he sea snake swims through and he gets the idea that there's one there and he'll try to get to it and and he'll fasten to the scales of the sea snake, then what's really interesting about it is that he's got to grow and reproduce because the sea snake sheds its skin every 30 days. So, I mean, that's how the sea snake stays clean and, the, you know, the barnacles have to revive itself. Uh, next thing I'm going to talk about is a crinoid. It's actually a basket star of some variety. There's many different varieties out there, but it's like it's got a starfish has got branches, but this has branches on its branches on its branches, and it gets to be about that big around. It kind of when it's opened up, it kind of looks like the sea fan. And it opens up, and all these plankton come through, and that's what it lives on. The, the one crinoid that they looked at in the uh, Great Barrier Reef had 36 different types of worms, one large worm, a dozen copepods, two species of shrimp, two species of crabs, three clingfish, and a snail, and that was just externally. Who knows what it's got internally, you know? And after the reef gets going, then sponges start growing on it. That's another one of the things that floats in the, the plankton and the uh, larval forms fasten to the different forms of, of uh, coral. Now there's two different types of sponges. This is one that you would probably recognize if you were scuba diving. I doubt if you'll ever see this one. This one is only found at like 800 feet. Uh, and you can see how delicate it is. It looks like a, a netting that's just kind of wrapped up in a, a form. This one is formed out of silicon where this one is formed out of calcium. Uh, and this is a shallow water one. Inside of this one is either a pair of little crabs, little tiny ones, or a pair of shrimp live inside of it. You can see that it's protected, but it's still open where the plankton can come through and they can still get their food and, and stuff and, and live with it. This one, I don't know if you can see it enough, but it's full of different holes. 
And with the water inside of each one of these holes, they have different types of ciliated organisms. And this ciliated, it means it's got hairs on it. And these hairs are constantly moving. So it draws the water in here and goes through the wall. And water comes out here. It circulates the water through it. And that's how it lives and grows. In, and you can see the, all the different holes and stuff on it. Each one of these holes has got a critter living in it. Uh, and they use these for protection then. And there's also critters living down in the tube itself. Uh, how amazing is this stuff? I'm going to tell you a story now. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I ran a, an aquarium shop. And I had a friend in Atlanta that had one of the nicest aquarium shops I've ever seen. I mean, it was like going into a public aquarium to see all the different critters and stuff. And I went in there one day and visited him. And he says, Ron, I'm glad you're here. Come look what I got. And he took me back into the aquarium room and he showed me what he called the pine cone fish. It's a fish about that big. It looks like a big pine cone. Each one of its big scales is outlined in black and you know, made it look like the scale was open. And he says, I said, oh, neat. And he had a $350 price tag on it. And he says, but I can't get it to eat. I said, wow. And then a customer walked in. And I stood there and looked at it and watched it and watched it. And he come back and he said, what do you think? And I hung around till after the store was closed, because I had some ideas. And after he locked the store up, and he says, now what do you think? I said, do you mind if I try? And I went and got a little net and dipped it in one of his tanks that he had seed shrimp in. And they're shrimp that only gets about that big. They're translucent. And they crawl around on the bottom, you know. They don't swim or anything like that. And I got six or eight of them, and I dumped it in that tank. And that fish started swimming very erratically. I said, well, we got the right food, but something's not working right yet. And he looked at it and says, turn out all the lights. And he turned out all the lights. And then you could see this fish go swimming down to the bottom. And when he went swimming to the bottom, he uncovered a plate on his cheek that was full of bioluminescence. And that light from those bioluminescent bacteria were lighting up the shrimp, and then he could see where it was, and he'd grab them. And you know, after about a half hour, all the little shrimp were gone. And I said to Jerry, well, we cured your problem. He said, yeah, now I can raise the price on it, because he's eating. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot of the deeper water fishes, you know, five to 800 feet, that have bioluminescence. Some of them got this antenna that sticks out in front of their mouth with a little worm-like bioluminescent thing and smaller fish come up to it and they inhale that little fish. They use it for bait. Uh, there are fish that use it like the pine cone fish to guide themselves. And there are fish that use it for like the lightning bugs. They light up to find a mate. Uh, most of the deep water fishes have great big mouths because they can't see. So if any, they can feel the vibrations, they just open their mouth and hope something swims into it. And right now, the Monterey Aquarium, and Daniel should know about this, uh, they've just opened up an exposition of all the deep water stuff showing different critters with bioluminescence. In the Gulf, we have a kenophore, they call it. It's like a floating jelly. It's just a 
blob, but it's got hairs coming down the sides of it, and that's how it moves around. Uh, but the one that they got at the Monterey Aquarium is about that big around, and it's bright red in color. Uh, there's no red light down in, at the depths that it uh, lives in, and they've got I don't know how many different species of, on display from the deep water stuff, but it would be something that would be attractive. Um, I talked about the anemone uh, community, and they did one, you know, uh, Disney made symbiosis a, a recognized word and a recognized thing with his movie on Nemo, mm -hmm. the little clownfish. Clownfish is another one of these things that's really neat to study. And you'll have maybe 10, 12 clownfish inside of an anemone, one male. The rest are all females. If that male gets eaten, and it happens a lot, then the most dominant female turns into a male, and the fe other females around it then, but there's only one male and one female that spawn. The rest of them are just there. And inside of this anemone, there's also <coughs> several species of shrimp and several species of crabs that live in the anemone. And these are fun to watch, too, you know, because uh, they all serve a function. And most of them are cleaning the anemone itself. Uh, they uh, go around and pick off some of this mucus that I was talking about earlier and carry it off to the edge of the anemone and, you know, take it away from the anemone. It's a, a cleaning process. And now I'm going to talk about some of the fish. Uh, the pilot fish, when it's that long, it lives inside of the Portuguese man of war, down in amongst the tentacles and stuff. And the Portuguese man of war has got the strongest nematocytes out there. And I mean, if you get stung by a Portuguese man of war, it's possible it could kill you. Uh, because I don't, they're very venomous. And it's such that he lives in amongst it as protection. Uh, uh, if another fish comes in and tries to grab him, the Portuguese man of war has just had dinner, you know, because uh, it'll kill that fish and, and eat it. And, but when this... Um, pilot fish gets bigger and they get to about that size. Uh, it's silver with black stripes going up and down its body. And it is called a pilot fish because it swims in front of sharks or boats or whales or whatever, you know, and, and kind of guides them, but that's not true. He, it's like the dolphins do when they ride the waves in front of a ship, he's just using the current to push him along. And they uh, are oppor opportunistic feeders, meaning if the shark kills a fish and all these little scraps come around, I mean, they're out there grabbing it. And like in other parts of the animal world, the stripes are a communication between it and other animals saying, if you eat me, you're going to be sorry. You know, you look at the coral snake, look at uh, all these other things, uh, different types of snakes uh, and spiders and, and stuff like that. They all project this same message. And then there's another fish about that long, uh, might, might be as big around as your arm. 
It's called a sucker fish or a remora. You've probably all heard of the remora. But his fin on his back sits on the back of his head and it's been adapted as suckers. So he fastens to other fish like sharks and manta rays and even the big sunfish, you know. And he, he's a very poor swimmer. And that's why he has adapted that, that uh, fin to pass into other fish. And he will pass into the other fish and they carry him around because he's a poor swimmer. That's his benefit. Uh, he also, a shark kills the fish, he will also take the scraps that are left over and eat them. And they've also been seen to, to be cleaners from, to clean other fish. Uh, picking parasites out of the gill packets and stuff like that. Uh, but he also has a relationship with man. The Orientals used to catch these, keep them alive, tie a rope around their tail. And when they went fishing, they'd throw them out in the ocean, leave them set there for an hour or so. And when they saw their little rope going, you know, that type of thing, they would pull them up. And this sucker fish had a fastened to another fish, and they used them as a form of fishing then. You know, very ingenious on the Orientals. Uh, Now I want to talk about a cleaning station. We've all seen uh, fish that, that come up to a coral head and these little other fish will clean it or shrimp will clean it. There's three different types of cleaners. They all look like this. Uh, two of them Two of them are wrasses, that's a family of fish, and this, this is a family of wrasses. One is a goby, but they're all blue with a black stripe going down the center of them. And they do what is called a guild. A guild is kind of a dance. They will come, the fish will come toward the, the uh, reef, and this little cleaner fish does a dance in front, and if the large fish is interested, he will stop and he will pose, they call it. He'll open his mouth, open his gills, and this little fish will then swim in and pick the, the dead meat and stuff like that off of the fish's teeth or, or pick the flukes out of the gill packet and stuff like that. Uh, they even sometimes, depending on how long the, the uh, host fish, the big fish, stays put, he might even skim over his body and pick parasites off of it. But usually they don't do the body. Uh, there are several other fish, like the baby butterfly fish and stuff. They are parasite pickers, and most of them do the body work then, but they all still hang around that same reef. Now, I'm going to equate this. This cleaner wrasse is one that if you had a scab on your arm, he would come and just nibble on the scab, taking the uh, repaired material off of that scab. The cleaner goby is only found in the Atlantic, not in the Pacific, but he's also a cleaner. He would come and pick on the scab, and then he would take the necrotic material around the scab, you know, and clean that as well. Now this other one looks just identical to these, but it's a blenny instead of a, a this is a wrasse. Uh, it's, it's a blenny. And when he comes up and he does his little dance like all the rest of them, but then when he comes up, he'll just swim up and he's, oh, and he'll just take a bite out of your arm. He, he doesn't care if he gets the scab or not. And that's how he makes his 
living by being a mimic, they call it. Uh, he, he mimics the cleaner fish and, you know, host fish can't tell the difference between the cleaner fish and the host, I mean, and the wrasse. So he, that's how he does it. And actually, you know, this host fish swims out, probably gets infection in that bite and comes back and then the cleaner wrasse gets to clean it again, you know, so they're kind of looking out for each other. But there's a lot of different fish out there that mimic, but don't have this same uh, realm about them that where they have to watch out. Uh, you have different uh, species, the puffer fish, the porcupine fish and stuff like that, they act as a cleaner. The trigger fishes, they act as cleaners. Uh, there's lots of other fishes. Uh, uh, baby angels act as cleaners. There's also a whole bunch of shrimp out there that live on the coral reef. They're all red and white in color. Bright red. Uh, and they all have stripes on them, white stripes. Some of them have the stripes going around their claws. Some of them have stripes going up and down their back. Some of them have stripes going around their body, but they're all red and white. And every one of them has white antennas on their head. And they'll sit on the reef, wave these antennas. That's their guild. And if the host fish comes by and and wants to be cleaned, you know, he'll stop and pose. And then the shrimp will crawl in their mouth and pick the food off of their teeth and, and crawl in their gills. And they also do a lot of crawling up and down the body of the fish. So how does the fish benefit? The fish benefits by being cleaned and also by getting a massage from all these little footprints uh, up and down their body. You know, it, uh, I know of probably about 10 different types of cleaner shrimp. And there's one that lives in the Atlantic as well as the Pacific, different species in the Pacific. But it's called uh, Stenopus hispus is a scientific name. But it's got the white and the stripes. Uh, but it doesn't show itself. It only shows its antenna coming out of a, a small cave. And they usually work on smaller fish. And the small fish then goes into the cave and gets cleaned in there. Now, in every one of these cleaning symbiotic relationships, you have the cleaner, you have the fish being cleaned, you have the parasite, and you have the mimics. They all invade this cleaning station. Uh, and, you know, not many people think about what makes up a cleaning station, but this is what actually puts it all together. I got a stupid question here for you. What color is a green moray? You, you're, you're all wrong. He's blue. And then he has a scum of bacteria, which is yellow, that grows over top of him. So you put the blue and the yellow together and you get green. You know? You can't even believe your eyes anymore. Now, they have done different studies and they found a really good, healthy reef. And this means one that had several cleaning stations on it. The cleaning stations actually help the reef. 
uh, they caught all the cleaners off of this one little reef and they took them all away from the reef and they moved them to an unhealthy reef about two miles away. In less than three years, the reef that they caught all these cleaners from died mm -hmm. completely. And the reef that they, the unhealthy reef that they put all these cleaners on was live and prosperous. Uh, so, you know, an experiment like that shows just how much a cleaning station helps uh, keep things going and cycling and, and you know. Yeah. yeah. I hope that you can see. I've still got a couple of things here. This is what they call a sea whip. And this is a plastic one. But these do not live in the aquarium or anything, so somebody manufactured a bunch of them so that you could get a more realistic form. But they found some of these, and these are full of different types of life too. They found two or three different kinds of, of um, shrimp on it, a couple of crabs and different worms and stuff like this. But there's also a little snail that lives on this. If you just look at it, you will not see him. And here's a much bigger version, but the one that's on the sea whip is probably only about that long. And he's got the same markings as what the sea whip does. But he is in this same family. I brought a much larger one. This is what they call a cowrie. Uh, they have, you know, you put this out on a reef. How long do you think it would last looking like this? It would be consumed the best that anybody could consume it. But these cowries have a skin that comes up over the shell and they back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And they do that to clean the different corals because this is a hard substrate. And they use it to clean the different corals and stuff from attaching on this. And that skin also looks just like it's got little I don't know what you'd call them, finger type growths on them and stuff like that. It camouflages the snail. And here's something that you probably don't know. In all of God's creation, what is the most prevalent species out there? And this is above water and underwater. No. I'm, different species I'm talking about. Plankton is probably only 10 or 12 different species of zooplankton and most of zooplankton is made up of larval forms. Insects? Insects, yes. If God created one insect every five seconds, it would take him longer than 24 hours. <laughs> Snails come in second place. If God created one snail every five seconds, it would have taken him more than 24 hours. Yet he did both in one day. Now, how amazing is that? I mean, we can't fathom how awesome our God is. Also living in the ocean, we have a lot of Bivalves, they call them bivalves because it's two pieces. It's a clam. Uh, you look at the back, the foot they call it, and it's just a muscle that fastens to the coral or whatever. And this is one of the giant clams as a baby. Giant clams are big enough that you can lay in. 
uh, and they are full of different types of symbiotic life too. Uh, you have crabs, shrimp, all the different uh, rhizomes and all this different kind of stuff living inside of it. They also have the zooxanthellae, uh, algae, and what have you. Uh, yes, I like. Do those bivalves get pearls? Not this. Oysters do the pearls. Uh, and they are doing them commercially now. They'll take a bunch of oysters as a small variety and implant sand in their shells on the inside and then let the oyster take over and, and coat this sand particle and the pearls are then made and then they harvest them. I was talking about the crown of thorns earlier and this is a, what I call a sea star. Everybody else calls them starfish, but I don't see any fish into them. But if you look, bioradically symmetrical. No matter what you turn up, it looks the same way. And there is the mouth is here. They have tube feet here, which they take the water out of the certain tube feet and then move it forward and put it down and then push water back in it and it forms a suction cup and then in another part the water disappears and that's how they motate around. And the anus is here and on there's a big star and you're supposed to say how big is it? Big? It's over and it's got over a hundred legs on it. And it's got spines like that on its back. And it eats other starfish. But there's a little shrimp that lives on this big star. And I showed you where the anus was, so if when it defecates, it's gonna stay right there in the middle of that star. But this shrimp's job is to go and get that waste product, carry it off to the edge of the star and drop it. You know, he cleans the star. And there's uh, sea urchins. I don't know if you know what they are or not, but they're nothing more than a, a test that's got big long spines in it. There's a little, and they also have the tube feet, but there's a little shrimp, it's called a bumblebee shrimp, black and yellow stripe, hence the name. Uh, and it lives in amongst the tube feet and it eats pieces of the tube feet, keeps them clean and stuff. And there's two or three other species of shrimp that live on the sea urchin, but there's also a couple of species of fish that live in amongst the spines of the sea urchin. And they don't swim like this, they swim like this so that they can get down into the between the spines and they're kind of strange looking fish and they're not they're like seahorses they're not strong swimmers but it was thought that they were just using the sea urchin for protection but that's that when they did stomach contents analysis they found that it is actually a cleaner on these sea urchins that they go down in there and their mouth is on the end and they pick some of that mucus off of the sea urchins and keep them clean. Uh, I was talking about the zooxanthellae and I found this out in the foyer of the church. This is what the man of war kind of looks like, but it's got long, long tentacles. This one doesn't have hardly any tentacles, but there are several of the sea jellies. Some of them have tentacles that are 40 and 50 feet long, and they all collect food. They're, it's, the tentacles themselves are colonized animal, like the corals, but they don't form the, the hard coating. And they all 
all the sea jellies have uh, zooxanthellae plankton in it. Now there's one that lives off of the coast of Florida here. It's called a cassopeia. It looks like this. And it lays on the bottom. And the zooxanthellae is in this part of it. And that's what keeps that thing alive. And it also collects the food for them. Uh, you know, lots of different species and lots of different things going on. And, and to me, it's our last frontier and we know nothing about it. It's something that needs to really be studied and they're finding out a lot more stuff. They're finding eight or ten new species every day uh, worldwide. My claim to fame in marine biology is that we were out in the middle of the Gulf. My major professor was studying deep water fishes. We threw the trawl overboard, ran for a while, pulled it back up, and dumped it out. Great big clamshells like that. That's all that was in it. No fish. And Doc says, we need to get these off of the deck. So we started picking them up and tossing them. And all of a sudden, I felt something wet in the palm of my hand. And I looked, a little black fish about that long. And I said, Doc, come here. And I showed it to him. And he says, what is it? And I said, well, as close as I can put it, it's a blenny. And I could tell by the fin structure and stuff that it was a blenny. And he says, we need to save some of them. So he took it out of my hand and put it in the pickle jar, you know. And we collected over 100 of them on that trawl haul. And it was a situation we couldn't identify it. We couldn't find any paperwork that had ever been written up on it. So we sent a specimen to China, the Philippines, Hawaii, Smithsonian, South Africa, you know, and the islands in the Caribbean and, and stuff like that, because we was out in the Gulf. And there was only one collected, and that was in the Smithsonian. We found out that it was a blenny piratus by scientific name, the pirate blenny. And, you know, I caught the second one. Uh, but my professor got all the honors. <laughs> so, uh, I hope uh, you can see now how delicate and intricate and and intertwining all of this stuff actually is. And not only above the water's edge, but below the water's edge. And, you know, it, there's a lot more that I couldn't talk about in just one hour. So, pressing together. Yeah. Unity. Living together, pressing together, coming together, however you want to say it. And let's bow for prayer if you will please yeah. heavenly father hear our prayer be with us now as we start our day and go through learning about you open the minds of our, these people from my classes and the videos and and dvds and stuff so that they can see how this world that you created, uh, your first book of life, uh, is so important and how we need all of this and how important it is to all of us. And I hope that this comes and people find this to try to change their ways and find you. As I pray in the name of Jesus, amen. amen.